Hello, you are on the Tarantino Tales channel and this is The Devil All The Time, a movie about people facing the harsh realities of life. Listen, pay attention, it's like I said. Okay, you're gonna fuck my wife and I'm gonna take some pictures, that's all. The film begins with a view of a map of the United States and a voiceover identifies the main locations of the unfolding events. The towns of Nokia Steve in Ohio, Coal Creek in West Virginia, and Meade, the narrator lying in between. The story starts in 1957 in Nockhamstiff. Here, Willard Russell lives with his family, a former Marine who had a face like Pennywise Clown. During World War II, he fought on the Pacific Front. The man leads his son into the woods where a cross made out of planks stands among the thickets. Here they pray. During a time of prayer, the story rolls back in time, just in time for the fighting. Russell and his unit find an American soldier crucified by the Japanese in a scorched clearing. His gruesome wounds were covered with flies, but he was still alive. Russell shoots him in the head to end the agony. Later, the demobilized Marine on his way home stops by a cafe in Mead Town, where he runs into photographer Carl Henderson, who also has an important role to play in the story. Russell and Carl meet their future wives here, waitresses Charlotte and Sandy. Back home in Coal Creek, an ex-soldier gives his uncle a trophy German pistol Luger. Russell's mother, from the first meeting, tries to match him up with the devout girl next door, Helen, whom she has her own fixation on. The mother once prayed to God to bring her son back alive from the war, promising in return to marry this very Helen. But Russell has very different plans for his life. For one thing, he can't stand the sight of the cross after that incident in the war, and for another, he can't get the waitress from the Mead town out of his head. At one of the church services, the pastor invites two new preachers, Roy Lafferty and his paralyzed disabled cousin. Roy, who was afraid of spiders as a child, poured an entire jar of arthropods on his head during the sermon to demonstrate how his faith in God has helped him overcome his fear. Russell returns to the Mead to meet his future wife. They later have a son and move to Knockhamstiff, where they rent a house with plans to buy it later. Shortly after moving in, while walking through the woods, Russell is suddenly struck by a desire to pray. He places a homemade cross out of planks in a small clearing which becomes his personal church devoid of rituals and trappings. A few years later, he notices that his son has a fresh bruise from being bullied at school by local children who are all related to each other. Russell takes his son to a makeshift church, explaining along the way that he needs to learn how to fight back for a cause. They pray as hunters pass by who bully Russell, but he remains focused on his prayer. Shit, I'm thinking now would be a good time to pay his old lady a visit. Dad? This is yours, the Lord's town, not nobody else's. A little later they go to town where a man beats up a sassy hunter and scares his buddy. Scrubbing blood from his hands, he teaches his son a lesson that any mob of bullies can be handled if you pick the right moment, especially when they are alone. However, when they return home, a much more fearsome enemy awaits them. Cancer. It was diagnosed to Charlotte. While his spouse is dying in the hospital, Russell makes his son pray with him for a miracle. But their pleas go unanswered. Then the Marine realizes that a sacrifice must be made. He kills his son's dog and brings its corpse to the homemade cross. But that doesn't work either. The wife is buried, and after the funeral, the son refuses to talk to his father, partly due to the killed dog. The kid prays while lying in bed and promises to bury the dog properly. In the evening, he goes to church, only to find not only his four-legged friend crucified on a cross, but also his father frozen, having slit his veins in despair. The orphaned boy is then sent to live with his grandmother and uncle in Coal Creek. The story rolls back seven years ago when devout Helen married preacher Roy and they had a daughter named Lenora. But during another spider-related trick, Roy is bitten by one instead of gaining superpowers and a desire to fight evil. He develops an allergic reaction that severely affects his psyche and perception of reality. After two weeks locked in a closet, an epiphany comes upon him and he rushes to share it with the world. He tidies himself up and goes for a walk with his wife, asking their neighbor to watch their daughter. 
In the woods, Roy is piously certain that the Lord has endowed him with miraculous powers, so he pierces his wife's neck with a screwdriver. He believes that she must die for him to resurrect her, just like Lazarus. But alas, the miracle does not happen. The woman's corpse remains lifeless, and the priest hastily buries her nearby. Crying faintly, he plans to surrender to the police, but his invalid brother persuades him to flee to the south. However, on the way, the preacher remembers his daughter and decides to abandon his cousin alone in the car while he hitchhikes on the highway. When he is picked up by photographer Carl and his wife Sandy, they turn out to be more than just simple do-gooders. They are serial killers with a twisted fantasy of picking up lonely men who hitchhike and taking them to the woods. There, Sandy engages in all sorts of things with them while Carl takes pictures. The couple tries to seduce Roy into participating in their deviant acts, but he refuses to copulate with the harlot. As a result, Carl has to kill him. The orphaned Lenora is then raised by uncle and grandmother of Arvin, the son of Willard Russell. The two children become half-siblings. The story shifts to the year 1965. For his birthday, Arvin receives a gift from his uncle, Luger, that was brought by his father. It is one of the few remaining possessions of the former Marine. In high school, the devout Lenora is bullied by her classmates, and Arvin stands up for his sister and gets beaten in the process. After school, they drive to the cemetery where Lenora's mother Helen was buried after her body was found in the woods. Each day, the girl reads her Bible at the grave while her brother, who was disappointed in God as a child, wanders nearby. As they prepare to leave, the pastor of the local church announces that his nephew, a seminary graduate, is coming to replace him and asks for a warm welcome. The grandmother prepares treats for the new pastor's arrival, as do the other devout locals. During the tasting of the treats, the pastor is urgently called to preach a sermon and, as a visual aid, he chooses the grandmother's dishes, which don't appear as rich as the others. The old lady is greatly distressed by this. Arvin even attempts to have a man-to-man -man talk with the pastor, but he is interrupted. Getting away from school bullies again, Arvin takes his sister to the cemetery, and in the meantime, he is excused for the first time ever, citing urgent business. Since he's not around when it starts raining, the girl hides in the church building, where she talks to the new priest. He offers to take her to a quiet place where he likes to be alone and pray. However, the priest's motives are much more down to earth, and he takes advantage of the vulnerable schoolgirl right there in the car. Meanwhile, Arvin follows his father's teachings. He tracks down the school bullies one by one and severely beat them. At the same time, Carl and Sandy embark on another vacation trip during which they plan to kill another hitchhiker. However, the woman is tired of playing the role of bait and wishes she could escape from her spouse, but she can't find the strength to do so. While looking through old photos of murdered men, she accidentally drops one on the floor, which is found by her brother, also known as the local sheriff who pays a surprise visit. Despite recognizing the photo as one of the missing men in the neighborhood, he chooses to do nothing. The sheriff's election is approaching, and a scandal involving the sister killer would not help him win. Furthermore, the sheriff himself is deeply involved in crime, accepting bribes and covering up prostitution and the activities of local businessmen. On their way to their vacation destination, the serial killers brutally murder a military man who was on his way to his unit's location. Upon arriving at the hotel, Sandy calls the base and informs them to not wait for their soldier as he has been killed, dismembered, and buried in a suitcase on the riverbank. Three months later, Lenora informs the priest that she is pregnant. He responds by accusing her of falsely accusing him. They had only prayed, he claims, and whatever the impressionable young girl had imagined and fantasized about is none of his business. How could I be? The daddy, when all we done is spent time with the Lord. Overwhelmed by morning sickness and disliking the pastor, the girl decides to skip Sunday service for the first time. Taking advantage of the fact that no one is at home, 
She goes to the barn, stands on a bucket, and puts a noose around her neck. At the last moment, she realizes that her relatives would understand and forgive her. The Lenora wants to get off, but the bucket slips treacherously out from under her feet. Already breathless, Sister is later found by Arvin in the barn. After the funeral, a policeman told him that his sister was pregnant. Arvin suspects the priest of it. After her death, he never once mentions the name of one of his faithful parishioners. The boy pulls out his father's luger, loads it and leaves home, leaving a note for his grandmother to say goodbye. When he arrives at church, he wants to shoot the preacher, but decides to talk to him instead. Under the guise of confession, Arvin tells him that he seduces little girls, takes them to the woods, undresses them, and then keeps their panties. He also mentions his alleged wife orally, threatening him in the evenings. In this story, Pastor recognizes himself and jumps up in a rage, suspecting that a guest is following him, and Arvin shoots the preacher. After the murder, he goes to Knockhamstiff, where he has one more unfinished business, but his car breaks down on the way and he has to hitchhike. The guy is picked up by the killer couple returning from vacation, despite his own unspoken rule not to deal with locals. When the car turns off the road, Arvin begins to suspect something is amiss. He notices a gun in Carlo's pocket popping out when he came out to pee and pulls out his own. When the killer comes to the door to threaten with the gun, Arvin shoots first. Two shots throw the maniac photographer to the ground. Sandy manages to take her revolver and point it at her traveling companion. A stalemate ensues. They are both at gunpoint. The guy tries to convince the woman to put the gun down and disperse in peace, but she shoots anyway, forcing him to pull the trigger. The woman bleeds to death after being shot in the neck, and Arvin is saved by a miracle and the paranoia of a serial killer. Not trusting his wife, Carl replaced the bullets in her gun with blanks before the trip. Searching the bodies of maniacs, the hero finds pictures of their victims. He realizes that those he killed were very bad people, which somewhat lessens his remorse. Taking the money and photo tapes, Arvin walks away. He still has to get to his father's makeshift church. In the meantime, Sandy's brother, Sheriff, visits a local crime boss under the pretext of a business visit, where he kills him along with his bodyguard from someone else's gun. He is informed that his sister is dead. Visiting the scene of the crime, he realizes that someone might find the rest of the pictures, proving her involvement in the missing people. The sheriff breaks into his sister's house and searches it. He finds a lot of evidence of crimes, including the murder of preacher Roy, Lenora's father, but he burns it all in a dumpster. At the station, he is informed of the murder of a priest in a neighboring county, and the caliber of the bullets matches those found on the bodies of his sister and her husband. And the suspect is listed as Arvin, Guy, whose father was once discovered in the woods. After comparing the route on the map, the sheriff realizes that the kid is heading toward his old house. He takes a shotgun and goes into the woods where he finds Arvin's belongings. The guy himself is hidden. After a little talking and searching, Sheriff finds the guy. They shoot each other, but the buckshot goes into the ground in a tree, while a bullet from Luger fits into the policeman's stomach. Arvin manages to show him a picture of his sister with the dead man, but he doesn't know that he is aware of. When the Sheriff let out his last breath, the boy carefully puts the bones of the faithful dog in a hole. He puts his father's trophy gun on top and covers the whole thing with earth, symbolically burying his past. On the highway, Arvin hitchhikes again. He's picked up by some hippie in a van. Remembering his past hitchhiking experiences, he tries hard not to doze off next to a stranger, but fatigue takes its toll. His eyes slip, and his inflamed mind tries to imagine the future that awaits him. Maybe he will return home to his grandmother, Maybe he will settle down somewhere and start a family. Or maybe he will go to war in Vietnam. No matter what, he is good at killing bad people. With these thoughts, Arvin's eyes close, his head falls on his chest, and he falls asleep.